AEW Dynamite review. The Holiday Bash on TBS last night from the Paycom Center in Oklahoma City. The show opened with the first Continental Classic Gold League match of the night between Swerve Strickland and Roosh. A cold open, by the way, to boot there. Uh, there was no light the fuse and breaking the rules and all that sort of stuff. We just went right into Swerve's opening. I enjoyed it much more. Started off with a little bit of mat wrestling and jockeying for advantage. They did a little lucha, a little back and forth. Roosh's hamstring was all taped up and began that selling that early after he hit a dive to the floor and Strickland went to work on it, but Swerve's shoulder was also all taped up and Roosh took out Swerve's leg as he stood on the apron and Swerve smashed that shoulder into the mat and then onto the floor. They went to picture in picture. Roosh hit a release belly to belly, belly to belly suplex, I should say, in the corner and went for the bull's horns, but his leg gave out. That allowed Swerve to put on a single leg Boston Crab and then a stretch muffler, which the crowd popped for. Uh, Roosh ended up getting out of that. They ended up on the apron where they were trading chops until Roosh belly to bellied Swerve onto the floor, which, as Brian would say, looked like it sucked. Uh, Roosh got a two out of that. Uh, when they got back in the ring, tried to go back up top, but his leg failed him, and that's pretty much where the end came. Swerve knocked him off, hit a 450, but Roosh kicked out with, uh, with, uh, adrenaline at one. Swerve then followed it up with a flatliner and a brain buster, but Roosh still kicked out. Swerve then kicked him in the head, went up top, and landed the double foot stomp to finally get the win. Swerve now has nine points and put all of the pressure on Jay White for later on, and Roosh ends up finishing the Continental Classic with six points. After that, we got a subdued, sensitive Chris Jericho to tell us that Kenny Omega's out with diverticulitis. And this went on for two minutes, and Jericho was so aw shucks during it that I kept waiting for Starks and Bill to come in and just start beating the hell out of them. It didn't happen. Also, what didn't happen was an announcement on what's going to be taking place with the AEW, AEW World Tag Team title at World's End. They had six days to figure something out. You got nine left to go. Eh, maybe they're extending out the drama to next week. I don't know, but I'd probably have uh, Starks and Bill run Jericho down, leading into whatever surprise you know is actually planned. I thought that would have came off better. And maybe if those belts come off the acclaim this weekend, it's Jericho announcing that it's going to be the acclaimed going after Starks and Bill and. Look, with Omega being out for a while, there's no reason to have Jericho in that mix at all with Starks and, and Bill. It, it doesn't help Starks and Bill at all, frankly. And I think they would be much better off maybe going back and forth with the acclaimed. I know the, the promos would be better, as we saw from last Wednesday night. Cottonwood Classic Gold League match. Mark Briscoe against Jay Lethal in a battle of guys who had not won a match during the tournament, but both are awesome awesome professional wrestlers this was an awesome professional wrestling match easily one of my favorites of the entire tournament both guys 38 years old both guys been wrestling for 22 years maybe longer in the case of, of mark briscoe having him under the mask at 16 years old and i think both of them have more to offer than what aew has given them thus far we'll see if that changes next year especially in the case of mark briscoe there were fargo struts redneck kung fu the cactus jack nesty plunge Taz referenced Lynn Swan, who retired in 1982, and everything that happened during the match made sense. It was almost perfect, and what wasn't perfect, you couldn't tell because they're so great at covering things up. Lethal tried a J-Driller, but Mark kicked out a two. He went for it again, but Mark pushed him off. Lethal went for a lethal injection, but Mark reversed it into a burning hammer. He followed it up with his own J-Driller to get the win. They shook hands afterwards. They started the year with a banger of a match between each other in tribute to Jay Briscoe, and they finished with one to watch the match. We then got a short video package on MJF being inducted in the Jewish Sports Hall of Fame that's located on Long Island before we went to break. When we got back from break, we got another video package of an intense Wardlow who says we are closer and closer to MJF's world ending, and it's time to bring the devil to his knees. Samoa Joe then came out to the ring, 
and said that even though Roderick Strong is the dimmest bulb on the Christmas tree, he made a good point last week, every time someone has been laid out by the devil's henchmen, we've seen it, except for MJF, who was just laying there. And, and Joe called him our luscious world champion, <laughs> said he was just laying there with a bottle next to his head. He's got questions, and he wants MJF to come out and answer them, which he does. He's also shooting back with a bunch of insults as well. And then MJF's got accusations of his own. He said when he was laid out in the back, as the goons surrounded the ring, they never touched Joe. And MJF wonders why he's waiting until World's End to fight Joe. But before they go any further, they're attacked by a bunch of Max henchmen. They came out of the crowd. Then a bunch more came out surrounded the ring the lights go out the devil comes on the screen they make a challenge for the roh world tag team title next week max are you a hero mjf begins to ask joe if he teamed with him but then joe grabbed the mic accepted on their behalf before storming to the back better be good better be good Renee's in the back interviewing the best friends, Orange Cassidy, Statlander, Rocky Romero, and Trent. She asks what Rocky and Trent have planned for the rest of the year. Rocky says he's just lost his welterweight title in Mexico, and he's looking for some more international opportunities. Orange then cut him off and said, I get it. I'll see you on Friday, and walks away. And Rocky shocked, and Chris and Trent congratulate him. He's got an international title match on Rampage. AEW Women's World Champion Tony Storm made her way to the commentary booth for the next match between Riho and Soraya for the right to face Storm at World's End. Ruby Soho was shown watching backstage with the announcers noting uh, her relationship, her budding relationship with Angelo Parker, maybe driving a wedge between Soho and Soraya. Wasn't long before the match was in a commercial break where Soraya was back in control. When they came back, Riho began a rally. The crowd was not really that hot for this. Uh, they were also not treated to what was getting, you know, taking place on commentary that we were all getting with Tony and Taz and Excalibur and Tony Schiavone just being ridiculous. Riho used a Northern Light suplex, and I was terrified because I thought Soraya was going to get spiked. She did not. Riho used a double foot stomp and then the running Meteora, and that was that. Tony came down to the ring, broke out some some opera glasses to see Riho with, who ended up jumping her. She hit the 619. Mariah May ran down, hit Riho with the title belt. Tony then took that opportunity to roll out of the ring into Luther's arms and ask who Mariah May was. She acted like she had absolutely no idea who this woman was as she got carried to the back. Tony Schiavone then stood up and read a prepared statement from Christian Cage, which to Tony did a really good job playing this up. It was uh, Cage says he, he took his son Nick Wayne on a well-needed vacation, and he'll be on collision to address Adam Copeland's no-DQ TNT title challenge for World's End. Then we see Samoa Joe and MJF arguing backstage. They go their separate ways. Max just walks a couple of steps, and oh, look what he finds on the ground. It's a black ski mask. The camera pans up, and it's in front of the Mogul Embassy's dressing room. MJF then knocks on the door, pulls Nana out, and demands an explanation. Swerve steps in between them, says, you better keep your hands off my property. They go back and forth. They bring up their past together. They invoke the name of William Regal, insults and all that stuff. Before we finally get to MJF asking if Swerve's the devil, Swerve says he's not the devil, but if MJF keeps getting in his face, he'll bring hell. The Mogul Embassy then steps out of the door. Samoa Joe walks up, pulls Max away, and Nana tells Swerve Strickland as he's closing the door, I'm sorry, boss. I forgot to put you on about collision last week. Could that mean something? I don't know. Wasn't the kingdom originally a, a Prince Nana thing way back when? Am I wrong about that? It's possible. It's possible, especially if you want to keep Brian Cage and uh, Toa Leona and Bishop Khan in ROH. Eh, could Nana have something to do with this? We'll see. Roderick Strong with uh, Taven and Bennett defeated Commander. After the match, Bennett and Taven put Strong's neck brace back on him and began posting MJF is the devil signs all around ringside. 
Renee got into the ring to ask Strong what they were doing. Strong yelled for Samoa Joe to believe him and to see that MJF is the devil. Renee asked Strong, well, if Joe believed him, wouldn't he have already listened to him by now? To which Strong said, Joe is his best friend by proxy. There are moments with the Roderick Strong thing, and I'm happy after all these years. He's on national TV. It doesn't work all the time, and it's too much, and it's... Ugh. I'm not saying it sucks, but it's close. Main event time, John Moxley against Jay White, Continental Classic. This was going to decide everything here for Jay White. White had to win the match outright to have a chance at, at advancing. Jim Ross came out to join commentary. First time he's been there in a while. Story of the match, Moxley's determination to go all out, even if he already had a spot in the semifinals, and to overcome a knee injury that he picked up in storyline by doing a dive to the outside. They were on the outside quite often during the first part of the match. Moxley hurt his knee, and the show went picture in picture. White slammed Moxley's leg around the ring post a few times before turning up his offense. When Moxley did turn things around and he went on the offense, he barely sold the knee at all. He's, he, he, he did. He was He's stomping him in the corner. He's jumping up and down on him, all that sort of stuff. Bret Hart, John Moxley is not, but... White did slam Moxley's knee into the ring steps. He then distracted the referee by threatening to use a chair as the ref was getting rid of that chair. He hit Moxley's knee with another chair, went for the Blade Runner, but Moxley reversed it into the paradigm shift for a two count. Moxley then tried for a bulldog choke, but White escaped. Tr both tried finishers back and forth for a little while. There were half and half suplexes, knee strikes, curb stomps, all that sort of stuff until finally... Finally, Jay White reversed a Death Rider and then hit the Blade Runner to get the victory, which means we have a three-way match next Wednesday to decide who gets into the final. As Filthy Tom Waller said a couple of days ago, makes sense if you're going under the idea that Eddie Kingston could end up in the finals here, that his story with John Moxley can, can have one more moment before... I would assume Kingston wins, takes advantage of a, a very injured John Moxley, who has now had his knee banged up. And in fact, after the match was over, as Swerve Strickland came out to, to glare at the two guys in the ring, Jay White went back after Moxley's knee. So we'll see uh, how they play that up coming up on Saturday on Collision, if they do any promos about it. And, but obviously, at least I think it's pretty obvious, it's going to probably play into the close of the match coming up on Wednesday. So that was your world-famous AEW Dynamite review for Wednesday, December 20th. I know. Just does not have the appeal that, that that Brian can give. It doesn't have that flair. Doesn't have that special feeling that Brian can impart into a report. But don't worry, everybody. Soon he's going to be back. Hey, if you love this clip, have I got a deal for you? WrestlingObserver.com. Do you have a commute? Do you work out at the gym? Do you like listening to audio on your headphones or your earbuds or whatever the kids use today? Well, WrestlingObserver.com will give you all the audio you'll ever need in your life. Over 15,000 audio shows. Every audio show that we have ever done, dating back to 2005, is available for subscribers at WrestlingObserver.com. Every time a new show comes out, you can podcast it directly to your phone. If you have a commute... As noted, if you go to the gym, if you like to lift weights and listen to Granny review soap operas, well, WrestlingObserver.com gets you full access to all of these shows and all of these archives. You can go back and listen to TNA reviews from 2010. You can go back and listen to reviews of every WWE pay-per-view, every big story that's ever happened in wrestling. You can get access to that at WrestlingObserver.com. Plus, full access to the Wrestling Observer newsletter every week. 40,000 words of news and information in pro wrestling. Why get all your scoops off Reddit, which aren't even accurate most of the time? Go right to the source, the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. You also get Observer Archives dating back to 1990. So check it out today. 
thousands of issues of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, tens of thousands of hours of audio, all for $12.99 per month or as low as $9.99 if you sign up for a year. You'll never, you'll never run out of audio if you subscribe to WrestlingObserver.com. So head up there, check it out today, and I'll talk to you again after a while.